Okay, good morning everybody. Good to see you again today. Welcome to the topics class and this is the final uh, lesson in our study on the dispensation of the grace of God. This is lesson number seven and for the last two weeks we have concentrated on the number five, how all through the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, <laughs> The number five is always closely related to the grace of God. It's what they call Bible numerology. And uh, each, each number uh, you can associate with different things. Well, number five is constantly being associated with the grace of God. And that's where we, what we have been doing the last two weeks. And we're going to conclude it this, uh, this morning. Uh, with three examples from the Old Testament. And it's just a, a miraculous thing how God has woven the, the pages of Scripture together uh, to, to form this new, new uh, numerical pattern, if you please. So um, it just uh, it thrills our heart because uh, this is a book that man certainly could not have ever written. All right, let's have prayer together and then we'll get right into the Word of God. Heavenly Father, now we pray, praise you and thank you for loving us and going to the cross, sending your Son to the cross to die for our sins. You loved us when we were unlovely, when we were nothing but sinners, lost and undone. And Lord, that's when you sent the Lord Jesus and he died and uh, redeemed us by his, the shedding of his precious blood. Lord, we're so thankful to be here today and fellowshipping with other believers and fellowshipping in the Word of God. Speak to us today out of the pages of Scripture, we pray. Glorify your name amongst us. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Okay, the, um, we've seen the grace of God and the number five. We've seen it about 37 times so far over the last two weeks. And uh, we're going to begin with number 38 to this morning. But almost every time in the Bible, the number 5 or the number 50 or the number 500 or the number 5,000 is always associated with the grace of God. Every time you see those numbers, the grace of God is on display some way, somehow in the Word of God. That's why we have said this is a book that hum, uh, man could not have possibly have written. And so uh, today we're going to study three Old Testament accounts where the number five and the grace of God is seen. The first one is we're going to see Noah and the grace of God. The second one we're going to see Abraham and the grace of God. And the third one, we're going to see the nation Israel and the grace of God. And all of these we're going to, is, is replete with the number five and God's grace. So would you take your Bibles, please, and turn to the book of Genesis, chapter 5. Book of Genesis, chapter 5. Okay. And Noah and the grace of God. The very first time that the word grace is found in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 6, and that's in verse 8, and it says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And when God said that, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, that's the fifth time that Noah's name is in the Bible. If you look back in chapter 5, first of all, um, verse 29, it says, He called his name Noah. That's the first time his name is in the Bible. Then you go down to verse 30. Lamech lived after he begat Noah. There's the second time we have his name. Then in verse 32, it says, And Noah, that's the third time, was 500 years old. And Noah, that's the fourth time, begat Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And then just you go into chapter 6 and the uh, eighth verse and there's the fifth time Noah's name appears, and it says, Noah found grace. There's the grace of God. Noah found grace in the, in the eyes of the Lord. So when did he find grace? We're going to see when he found grace of God from this, uh, this uh, sixth chapter. Now, going back into chapter 5 and verse 32, it says, Noah was 500 years old. 
and Noah begat Sham, Ham, and Japheth. Okay, here we have the number 500, which of course is a multiple of five. 100 times uh, five is 500. And it was at the age of 500 that Noah found grace. Verse 6 says that he found grace, and we read there the last verse of chapter 5. He was 500 years old when he found grace. And so here again is the number number 5, 100 times 5 is, is 500. And God sent the flood and destroyed the world when Noah was 600 years old. So he found grace when he was 500 years old, and God sent the flood when he was 600 years old. Now actually, there was, there's more than a hundred years in between here. We're going to see it's a time period, there's a time period of 120 years here, uh, which we'll explain when we get to it here. But notice right at the bottom of the first page there, Genesis 7:11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, according to the ancient calendar, the second month would be November, and the 17th day of the month, that'd be the 8th, November 8th, the same day where the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were open. That's the date of the flood and all the archaeological evidence that, uh, or I should say ge um, uh, geographical evidence, uh, points to the fact that that was the time of the year when the flood came. It was in the fall of the year, the early fall. Okay, number six is the number of man. We saw that last time. And that judgment came upon mankind when Noah was 600 years old. But at 500 years old is when Noah found grace. Let's go to the next page here. The world conditions in Noah's day, they were not good. In fact, they're probably pretty much similar to today. In Genesis 6, 5, it says, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his art was only evil continually. What a bleak picture of humanity is painted for us in verse 5. Then we drop down to verse 12, And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And then in the 13th verse, God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. So we see from these three verses, we see the total depravity of man. That's a Bible doctrine that is true today. The total depravity of man. That man is a totally depraved creature. Man has no goodness about him that he can offer to God for God to uh, bless him or save him or forgive him or, or any such thing as that. The Bible says that our righteousness, the best we can do, is nothing more than filthy rags in God's sight. We have nothing that we can give, give to God. Man is a totally depraved creature. When God saves an individual, that individual has to totally cast himself upon the grace of God. The grace of God. God's grace. That undeserved, unmerited favor. Because we have no goodness, we have no righteousness, we have nothing that we can give to God. The Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So here we see the human race, a totally depraved race of people. But, verse 8 says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Well, somewhere along, and we wrote down here between Noah's 500th year and 600th year, uh, that's not exactly correct. It would be around Noah's 500th year and 600th year. There was an age of grace, a little, small age of grace. Now we're living in the age of grace today. The age of grace began in the book of Acts, and it's been going on for 2,000 years now. And this is the dispensation of the grace of God and we're enjoy, we enjoy God's grace. He's not dealing with us through the law. He's not dealing with us through animal sacrifices. He's not dealing with us uh, in, in any manner of, uh, of uh, us having to go to him through a, 
through a priest with a blood sacrifice. He's dealing with us today through his grace. Well, there was a age of grace, a little small age of grace, that took place back there in the days of Noah. And we find it in Genesis 6-3. It says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. My spirit shall not always strive with man. That's talking about the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. And so we have here a hundred and twenty years of grace, which happens to be a multiple of five. Five times twenty-four is a hundred and twenty. So for a hundred and twenty years, there was the grace of God manifesting itself to the world. During that 120 years, Noah is building the ark, and all the world had an opportunity to see that ark and know that the judgment of God is coming. You notice uh, that this ark is a ship of grace, and it was available to all people, the door of the ark was open, and Noah invited souls inside. Now, how do we know that Noah invited souls to come inside the ark? Well, here's a New Testament revelation. 2 Peter 2.5. It says, He spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person. And look what it calls him, a preacher of righteousness. A preacher of righteousness. He preached the righteousness of God. And it says it, uh, that it brought in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. So here we see that the ark was a ship of grace. Anybody could have access to it that wanted to. All they had to do was, was want, to, want to. And that door of that ark remained open for 120 years. But at the end of that time, the age of grace ended. God came and he shut the door. Genesis 7, 16 says, And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. God shut the door of the ark. The Bible says that God shutteth and no man openeth, God openeth and no man shutteth. God shut the door. No man could open that door any, at, at any time. And so that door was shut and it was shut, uh, uh, and the floodwaters came, and hum all of humanity was destroyed. The age of grace came to an end. But that third verse says, My spirit shall not always strive with man. That's the Holy Spirit. And during this age of grace, that is what the Holy Spirit is doing. Striving with man, that's conviction. Without the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, nobody would get saved. The Holy Spirit has, has to convict of sin. He has to show the sinner what a dirty, vile, rotten sinner he really is. He has to show the sinner the total depravity of our hearts, that there's none that doeth good, no, not one, as it says in the book of, in the book of Romans. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. By one man sin entered into the human race and, by, and death by sin and so uh, uh, death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. And so mankind comes short, comes short of the glory of God. Well, Jesus tells us in the Gospel of John that that's the work of the Holy Spirit. Genesis 6.3 says, My spirit shall not always strive with man, but Jesus uh, instructed us in that in John, if you notice there, John 16, 7. He said, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter, that's Jesus' name for the Holy Spirit, the Comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. Okay, so Jesus departs. He's caught up. He, he, he dies, rises again, sends up into heaven. He sends the Holy Spirit. That's the day of Pentecost, okay? That's John 16, 7. The next verse, verse 8. And when he is come, when he, the Holy Spirit, is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. In other words, he's going to convict of sin. So during that little mini 120-year 
dispensation of grace back there in Noah's day, the Holy Spirit was striving with men. He was convicting of sin. Not one single one responded. Not one. Noah is preaching righteousness, as we saw from Second Peter. No one is responding there at all. And just like today, the human race is re reject, rejecting the, uh, the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. Look at Acts 7.51 there. This is Stephen preaching just before they killed him. He says, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. As your fathers did, so do ye. Resisting the power of the Holy Spirit. I wonder what the Calvinists do with that verse. You know, they got that little acronym, TULIP. The I in TULIP stands for irresistible grace. Doesn't sound to me that like grace is irresistible. Peter, or Stephen says, you, you and, and your fathers have always resisted the Holy Spirit. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 29, we have another example of people resisting the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Of how much sorer punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath, first of all, trodden underfoot the Son of God. How do you do that? Well, when the Holy Spirit is convicting you that you need Christ, you just step on him rather than accept him as Savior. Number two, hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he is sanctified an unholy thing. Make fun of the blood of Christ. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission, Hebrews 9.22. The book of Romans says we are justified by his blood, Romans 5.9. Uh, in the book of Ephesians, it says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, Ephesians 1.7. Uh, the Bible tells us it is the blood that maketh an atonement for your sins, Leviticus 17.11. Uh, the, the blood of Christ is the only basis on which God forgives sin. So the person here under conviction has trodden underfoot the Son of God, and, and he has uh, called the, the blood of the covenant an unholy thing. And then here's the third thing he does there. He hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. The word despite means insult. He's insulted the Holy Spirit. As the Holy Spirit calls him, to receive Christ as his Savior, he tells the Holy Spirit, no, I don't want it. We have a man in the Bible that did that. Remember King Agrippa? And King Agrippa said, almost you've persuaded me to become a Christian. We have another man in the Bible that you find in the chapter, I believe it's the chapter before Agrippa there. And I forget, is that Felix or Festus? I forget, I get those two mixed up. But he was under, Paul is preaching to him and he's under conviction and he's actually trembling. But he says to Paul, go your way. I'll hear you some other time on this matter. This is what sinners do many times rather than when they're under conviction, rather than turn to Christ. Well, not now. I'll make it later and later never comes. So um, God... Um, God enters into this, into this relationship here with, um, uh, I lost a page here. He enters into this relationship with, um, with Noah by a covenant of grace that he, that he makes with him. So the ark, he, he gives us the dimensions of the ark and in Genesis uh, 6, 14 and 15, it tells us that the ark was 300 cubits, 300 cubits in length. And it was 50 cubits in the, the wide, the breadth of it was 50 cubits, and the height of it was 30 cubits. All of those are multiples of five. 300 cubits is 60 times 5. 50 cubits is 10 times 5. And 30 cubits is 6 times 5. So every part about that ark has the number 5 connected, connected with them. And Noah began to build that ark when he was 500 year, years old. So 120 years, there was an age of grace. 
And that age of grace was committed unto Noah, just like the dispensation of the grace of God today was committed unto the Apostle Paul. And the Holy Spirit convicted of sin back then, just as he does today. And there was, the world was filled with gross wickedness back then, just as it is today. And so 120 years um, is a mul also a multiple of five. That's 24 times five. That's how long that age of grace lasted. When the age of grace ended back then, it was followed by worldwide mm -hmm. judgment. The flood came and destroyed them all. When this age of grace ends, it is also going to be followed by worldwide judgment. The Bible calls it the tribulation period in which God's wrath and fury is poured out upon the world. But the church will not be here any more than Noah was not there. Noah was safe inside the ark. The church will be safe in heaven because God's going to rapture the church out before that happened. He's going to spare us just like he spared Noah. Now, the second instance from the Old Testament is Abraham and the grace of God. In Romans chapter 4 and verse 16, the scripture says, Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. What is he talking about? To the end the promise might be sure to all the seed, and not that only which is of the law, but that also which is the faith of Abraham. Oh, he's talking about the faith of Abraham here. Who is the father of us all? Did you know that if you're a believer, Abraham's your father? He's your spiritual father. He, he's the father of faith. It, Abraham is held up as a great example of faith in the Bible. It's called the father of faith. And we are told that when, when we become believers, we're, uh, Abraham becomes our father here. Now, would you turn over, please? You're, you have your Bible open to Genesis 6. Would you turn over to Genesis 15? We're going to see this next, next example of, of the grace of God here. Okay, so Abraham is our spiritual father. Paul says that he was, that we are saved by faith, uh, by grace through faith, Ephesians 2, 8. The same is said here of Abraham, that it is of faith that it might be by grace, for by grace are ye saved. So Romans 4, 16 says virtually the same thing. Now, in Genesis chapter 15, God calls out Abraham. We're going to begin reading here in verse 5. In verse 5 it says, He brought him forth abroad and said, Look now towards the heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto them, So shall thy seed be. He tells Abraham, I'm going to bless you. You're going to have an abundance of children. But Abraham is pretty old at this time and he doesn't even have one son yet. All right. But verse 6 says, He believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. Now that is the grace of God. God takes our faith and he puts it, deposits in our account his righteousness. Our faith is deposited as his righteousness. His faith is counted for righteousness. That's grace. You can't call it anything else. That's the grace of God. Verse 7. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And of course, Palestinians don't know that today. Uh, going way back here in Genesis 15, God gave this land to Abraham and his descendants. And we find out that that was through Isaac and not Ishmael at all. All right, verse 8. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? Abraham asked this question, how am I going to know? How am I going to know that this is, is my land? Well, Abraham was the first Hebrew, right? He's the first Hebrew. And this is something we find the Hebrew race doing all through the Old and New Testament. How will I know what you're saying is true? Give me a sign. Show me some kind of a sign. They drove Jesus crazy. He'd preach, he'd preach and tell them something. They'd say, give us a sign. Give us a sign. We want to see. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, the Jews require a sign. They're always asking for a sign. Well, Abraham was the first one. He says, how, how am I going to know that I'm, that I'm going to inherit this land? And God tells him, he says, okay, I'm going to make a covenant with you. This is, this is how 
This is how you're going to know. Verse 9. He said unto him, Take me a heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. Okay, five animals. Five animals. Here's number five again. We're going to see the grace of God connected with the number five here. Verse 10. And he took unto him all these and divided them in the midst, and laid each piece one against another, but the birds divided he not. So what Abraham did, he cut the heifer in half. He lays half of it here and half of it here. Then he takes the goat. He cuts the goat in half. He lays it right up against the heifer, half of it here, another half of it here. Then he takes the ram, cuts the ram in half, puts it right up against the goat, lays it one half here, and one half here. And then he's got a turtle dove and pigeon. They're kind of small to cut in half, so he puts the turtle dove here, pigeon here. Okay, so he's got two lines of the carcass of these animals. Now this is something that is still done by the Bedouin chiefs out there in the desert in that part of the world today. A covenant, when they enter into a covenant with someone, this is what they do. Now, before we go, we're going to just leave Abraham for just a second here. If you look down at the bottom of the, your page there, Jeremiah chapter 34, verse 18 and 19. Okay, this has nothing to do with Abraham. This is just talking about the covenant, okay? He says, And I will give the men that have transgressed my covenant, which have not performed the words of the covenant which they had made before me. When they cut the calf in twain, that's what Abraham did, and passed between the parts thereof. Oh, you got to cut these animals in two. You lay one here, one here, and that forms a path, and you got to walk down that path between the carcasses of these animals. And when you do that, that signifies you have entered into the covenant with the person you're making the covenant with. And going back to Jeremiah 34 there, it says, when they cut the calf in twain and passed between the parts thereof. And then we find there was, guess how many groups of people? Five. Five that entered into this covenant. Number one, the princes of Judah. Number two, the princes of Jerusalem. Number three, the eunuchs. Number four, the priests. And number five, all the people of the land, which passed between the parts of the calf. Now, in that covenant, whatever that covenant was, uh, just involved the calf. Abraham's covenant involves five animals, five, the number of grace. And Abraham <coughs> has to, or I'm, I'm sorry, uh, the, the, the participants of the covenant have to walk that pathway between the carcasses of these animals. But what happens here? Let's read on. Verse 11. <coughs> It says, the fowls came down upon the carcasses, and Abraham drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abraham, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. He's, he's prophesying to Abraham about the four hundred years of slavery in Egypt, which was a long way off yet. And then he says in verse 14, also that nation whom they shall serve, I will judge, and afterwards they shall come out with great, uh, great substance. And thou shalt uh, go to thy fathers in peace, and thou shalt be buried at a good old age. Okay, let's go down to verse 17. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, that's what we read in verse 12, behold a smoking furnace and a burning lamp. God comes down in the, in the form of, of a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that uh, says that passed between those pieces, those carcasses of the animals. God enters into this covenant by walking that pathway, just as it talks about down there in, in Jeremiah chapter 34 at the bottom of your page. God walks that pathway entering into this covenant with Abraham, but Abraham doesn't walk the pathway because he is sound asleep. And so there is nothing binding upon Abraham. He has agreed to nothing. 
all of the covenant, the responsibility of that covenant is God's responsibility. This is what we call an unconditional covenant that he makes with, with Abraham. And so in um, verse 17, God enters into this covenant relationship with Abraham. The covenant is concerning the land, the land that is in dispute even now. And in chapter 15, verse 12, Abraham sleeps through the whole thing. Abraham wakes up and he has entered into a covenant with, with Jehovah God. He has no responsibility in this covenant at all. All the responsibility is God's. You know what we call that? Grace. The grace of God. God's grace. It's a covenant of grace that he makes with Abraham. It's a, a, a covenant that is uh, eternal, still in effect. That land still belongs to the Jews and they will have it in God's own time. It is a non-binding covenant upon Israel. It doesn't matter what they do or don't do. God says, that's going to be their land. I've, I've agreed to, to this, and this is the terms of the covenant. And just because Abraham didn't walk that pathway and agree to it, doesn't make any difference. God did. And that's this eternal, uh, eternal covenant that God has, has made with him. That is the grace the grace of God here. Okay, remember God, we, we talked about this last week, God changes Abraham's name from Abram to Abraham. And the way he did that, Abram was his name, and Abram means high father. God changes his name to Abraham, which means father of a multitude. And the way he changed his name is, takes the Hebrew letter He and adds it to Abram and it becomes Abraham. Well, the letter He is the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. That's the fifth letter. And the Hebrews used letters for numbers. They didn't have numbers like we do. They're like the Roman numerals. The, the, the Romans used letters for numbers. And so uh, He, which is the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, is also used as the number five in Hebrew. And so... Uh, he changes his name as he enters into this covenant by adding the fifth letter, which is the number five in the Hebrew language. Now, interesting enough, Abraham's name is found five times in the church epistles. Romans, Second Corinthians, Galatians, Hebrews, and James. Five New Testament epistles has Abraham's name in it because of the grace of God. And his name is found in, in, in the um, entire New Testament in 10 different New Testament books. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts, as well as those five epistles. And so again, the, the number five is so uh, greatly associated with Abraham. Abraham enters into the covenant, he agrees to nothing. It's an unconditional, irrevocable covenant, which is in effect still to this very day. All right, let's go to the last one, Israel and the grace of God. Israel had been slaves in Egypt for 400 years. God's going to do two things here. Number one, he's going to raise up Moses to deliver them out of Egypt. And then 40 years later, he's going to raise up Joshua to lead them into their own promised land, as he, uh, the land that he gave to Abraham here in Genesis 15. Okay. Now, when they left Egypt, the Exodus took place. When they left Egypt, in Exodus chapter 13 and verse 18, it says, but God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt. Now that word harnessed, it's, uh, you can look it up in Strong's Concordance. It's number 2571. It's the Hebrew word shamash, shamash, and it means soldiers in ranks of five. Soldiers in ranks of five. So when um, uh, there, there was about, we believe there was about two million Jews in the Exodus. And just think, two million Jews marching out of Egypt and across the Red, come to the Red Sea, across the Red Sea, and heading towards the Promised Land. 
two million of them marching in ranks of five. That's what it said. Now, looking up these Hebrew words in, in Strong's Concordance, notice every, uh, all the root words that come out of this word. Uh, there, there is, and I, I'm, I'm not going to try to pronounce these, uh, but we put the number in there in case you want to check them out. The one word there means the fifth part. The other word means the number five. The other means to tax one-fifth. The next one means the fifth rib. And then uh, the last one there, it's a long one, it means 50, which is a multiple of five. So everything connected with this word is, is connected with the number five here. And out they come in ranks of five, two million people with all their livestock out of Egypt, across the Sinai pen, uh, Peninsula, across the Red Sea, and then on through the wilderness. Now, um, the second man that God raised up here was Joshua, and Joshua led them into the Promised Land 40 years later. Okay, in Joshua 1.14, right down at the bottom of the page, your wives, your little ones, your cattle shall remain in the land with Mo that which Moses gave you on this side of Jordan, but ye shall pass before your brethren armed all the mighty men of valor and help them. That word armed is the same identical Hebrew word that is translated harnessed in Exodus 13, 18. It means exactly the same thing. They marched into the promised land in ranks of five, five abreast. They came out of Egypt in ranks of five. They entered into the promised land 40 years later in ranks of five. Then um, uh, it, it's identically the same word. The same, the same word. Now, to this day, you go over to Egypt, to this day, and this day, the number five is considered bad luck to Egyptians. You know, we Americans say, oh, number 13, that's a bad luck. By the way, the, the last Friday was the 13th. I didn't hear anybody ever <laughs> mention that. Um, but some people think it's bad luck. Well, in Egypt, they think number five is bad luck. Did you know that in Arabic, which is the language they speak over there, there is no number five? Number five is shown just as a zero, just like a zero. You take an Arabic clock, you know, it's got the different characters on it. You come to where five is supposed to be, just a zero. That, that's what they use for, for number five. It's replaced by a zero. The day that Israel left Egypt marching out in ranks of five, they lost their labor force, which was all slaves. That was the Hebrews, they all left. They lost their crops because the plague of hail destroyed all their crops. They lost their cattle because that same plague of hail destroyed all their cattle. They lost their Pharaoh. He drowned in the Red Sea. They lost their assistant Pharaoh, the uh, Pharaoh's son. That was in when the Passover took place, the eldest son. Pharaoh didn't put any blood on his doorpost. The angel of death came and took his son. So they lost their pharaoh and their assistant pharaoh. Sixthly, they lost their entire army in the Red Sea. The Bible says that their whole army was in pursuit of the, of the, uh, uh, of the, of the Jews there. And number seven, they lost their faith in their gods because the 73 great gods of Egypt were gods that were supposed to protect the people, the crops, the animals, everything. And God, uh, God sits in the heavens and laughs because those plagues destroyed everything those gods were supposed to protect. So they lost everything. And to this day, the number five is still regarded in Egypt as bad luck. Probably most of the people don't know why. It's like, why is 13 regarded as bad luck? I don't know. There must have been something that happened a long time ago. Now going, this brings us to the end of our dispensation of the grace of God. We put a page in there. It's about the Bible. This book contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy, its precepts are binding, its histories are true, and its decisions are immutable or unchanging. This book, we are to read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, and practice it to be holy. 
It contains light to direct you, food to support you, and comfort to cheer you. It's the traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's charter. It's in the Bible that paradise is restored, heaven is opened, and the gates of hell are disclosed. Christ is the grand object. Our good is its design, and the glory of God is its end. The Word of God should fill the memory, rule the heart, and guide the feet. We are to read it slowly, frequently, and prayerfully. The Bible is a mine of wealth, a paradise of glory, and a river of pleasure. It's given for you in life, it will be opened in the day of judgment and will be remembered forever. It involves the highest responsibility. It will reward the greatest labor and will condemn all who trifle with its sacred contents, meaning to add, subtract, or change any part of it. And on the back page, we put that little quotation that we gave you last week because some have asked me to do that. What a book, the Bible. Man could not write it if he would, and man would not write it if he could. Written 16 centuries apart by men that were total strangers to each other. And it was written from Israel, Arabia, Moab, Jordan, Babylon, Persia, Europe, Asia, Rome, Patmos. <laughs> if you're wondering what that last one is, it's a typo, it should be jail, the jailhouse. <laughs> but yet it fits together perfectly. Well, this brings us to the end of our study on the dispensation of the grace of God. Let's have prayer together and we'll be dismissed. Thank you now, Lord, for our time together. Bless us as we leave this place. Thank you, Lord, for this book. Only God could put it together as you have. Thank you for it. Help us not to neglect it, reject it, or do anything inappropriate to it. But, Lord, just to read it, believe it, accept it, and share it with others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for coming. You are dismissed.